الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد all praises due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى we praise him and we thank him for all of the blessings that he has given to us including the icy storm that is outside الحمد لله we praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى that he's given us the blessing of having cars of the blessing of getting from point A to point B uh, safely so this is from the immense blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, sometimes I sit down and I wonder how did the people live in this land a century ago or two centuries, three centuries ago with such uh, extreme weather. And subhanAllah, you just can't help but thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of the blessings that we have. So we bear witness and we testify that there is none that has the right to be worshipped, to be venerated, to be unconditionally obeyed except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we bear witness and we testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his last and his final messenger. Alhamdulillah, we began our discussion of the explanation, the commentary, the tafsir of Surah Naba, the first surah of the 30th portion of the Quran last time. And we learned that this surah can broadly be divided into three sections. The first section can be termed as the denial of the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about and addresses the, the people who deny a belief in the hereafter uh, indirectly. Allah is not being muhatab with them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not addressing them directly. Rather, what we see is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing them by means of tabi'id, by means of distancing himself. Allah says, that Allah quotes them that this is what they say that they are debating and they are wondering and they are talking and they are discussing at length when will the day of judgment come is it really happening and they have sarcasm in their questions they're not asking out of genuine curiosity or genuine inquiry rather they are asking just in order to mock the believers so the first section spans ayat 1 to 5 one to five, and this we can call the denial of the hereafter. The second section covers ayat 6 to 16. Ayat 6 to 16. And this second section can be called the human weakness or inability compared to the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what this uh, second section talks about where Allah puts us in our place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us and Allah tells us of the great blessings and the great creation that he has in place. And compared to us, look at the things that we create. There is absolutely no comparison. And then comes section number three, which we shall begin today. Section number three, we can call it that which you denied. The things that the people have denied and here we notice a difference in address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now addresses those who disbelieve directly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts human beings in their place so in ayah number 17 let's begin from there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim inna yawma al-fasli kana miqata Allah says Certainly, the day of judgment is an appointed time. The day of judgment is an appointed time. Inna yawmal fasli kana miqata. Al fasl is to take two things and separate them so much that they are clearly apart from one another. This is what fasl means. Fasl means that two things are together, you separate them such that each one of these entities are completely torn away from one another. You see a demarcated difference between the two. This is the meaning of fossil. From the meanings of fossil is separation, clear separation. So the scholars of Tafsir, the common, they say the day of judgment is the day when truth shall be separated from falsehood. about Kuchar Khani. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now says that this is the day 
of separation. So the scholars explain that the mushrik who believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who believed in other gods, those who did evil, on that day they will come to know truth. And they will say, if only we believe with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says, this is a day of clear distinction. And miqata, the word miqat means appointed, that is firmly appointed. So the day of fasl has already been fixed. So you and I as human beings, we already have an appointment with our Lord, with our Creator. Every minute, every day, every second, we are marching forward towards this appointment that we have. You see? In this world, we have appointments with people of influence, we have appointments for a job interview, we have appointments with the specialist, with a special uh, physician, with a doctor, maybe it's six months down the line, maybe it's six days down the line. Allah says this day of resurrection, whether you accept it or not, whether you acknowledge it or not, you are marching towards this day. So, this day has already been fixed. The second thing is, in this surah, we saw that Allah created things in pairs. Allah talks about night, Allah talks about day. Allah talks about the creation of human beings from a man and a woman. Allah has created things in pairs, all right? So what is the pair then? You may wonder, a fossil, the day of fossil. What is its pair? Well, life is its half. Its other half is the akhirah. This world is one half, and the akhirah, the day of judgment, is the second half. Both together make one. So this is the interesting uh, similarity that we see that is coherent with the message of the surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the human being, you better realize, you better understand and acknowledge that you are marching towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are coming to meet him. Ayah number 18. The day the horn is blown and you will come forth in multitudes. The day on which the horn is blown. This horn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains to us and the Prophet sallallahu has told us when he went on the journey of Isra wa Mi'raj, he said that he has seen the angel holding the trumpet close to his mouth. It's not that the angel who will blow the trumpet is waiting to take the trumpet to his mouth and then blow into it. No, no, no. The angel of blowing the trumpet, what's his name? Does anybody know? Israfil. Jazakallah khair. Israfil. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. He says that the angel who is appointed to blow the trumpet on Yawm al-Qiyamah is already holding the trumpet to his lips. And his eyes are fixed on the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the angel Jibreel alayhi salam told our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Israfil has not blinked ever since this responsibility was given to him. Because at any moment, the Day of Judgment would come. And I mentioned this, um, well, perhaps uh, we didn't mention it in our khutbah, that the Prophet ﷺ told us in an authentic hadith that every single Friday, there is no angel close to Allah, there is no heaven, no earth, no mountain, no sea, except that it seeks Allah's refuge, except that it fears that the Day of Judgment will occur. Because the Day of Judgment will occur on a Friday. So, the Prophet ﷺ is teaching you and me how close the Day of Resurrection is. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said that I have been sent so close to the appointed hour like this. And this is how the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. Or the Prophet ﷺ gestured by saying, this is how close I am to the Day of of resurrection. In another version of the hadith, the Prophet peace be upon him said, it is my coming to you and the coming of the day of judgment is so close together, it is as if I have come during the day and the evening will be the day of resurrection. In fact, our Prophet وسلم, is from one of the portents of the hour. He himself, his coming is from one of the signs of the day of judgment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Yawma yunfakhu fi sur. 
on that day that the trumpet shall be blown فَتَأْتُونَ أَفْوَاجَ and you will see that فَتَأْتُونَ أَفْوَاجَ and فَتَأْتُونَ you all of you will come forth in multitudes this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said Allah Azza wa Jal says also فَتَأْتُونَ أَفْوَاجَ not only will you come forward in multitudes but you yourselves will give yourself up you see many times we've heard that people who commit a crime you know, robbers or thieves, they commit that theft and they feel so bad about it, they go back and surrender themselves to the cops. You've heard of this, right, Walid? They do that. They go, they, they just had this feeling that, you know what, I didn't do something right. And then they go and they surrender themselves. So on this day, فَتَأْتُونَ afwaja, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that not only will you come forth and march forth in multitudes, but you will give yourself up, you will surrender yourself. So what does this mean for us as believers? What this means is that on that day we will realize how weak we were, that we were perhaps able to hide our sins, hide our agenda, our plans from our parents, from our siblings, from our boss, from our friends, but who couldn't we hide it from? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally we will come on the day of judgment and we'll realize no place to run. We are here and to Allah we surrender. Ayah number 19. Allah says, and the heaven is opened and will become gateways. This sama that Allah tells us in Surah 67, Surah Mulk, that 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 look at the skies, look at how beautiful these skies are created. You don't see any flaw in the creation of the skies. In fact, go again and again and again and look. Where do you see any cracks? Do you see any gaping hole? Do you see any opening? Do you see the sky fall to the ground? You don't see that. But on, the, on that day, Allah is saying, وَفُتِحَتِ السَّمَاءُ فَكَانَتْ أَبْوَابًا And these heavens that you see, are going to turn into gateways. Now, I want us to reflect over gateways. What does it mean, door? The door is one of the weakest links in a house. If you create a house, you create the walls, you construct the roof, you construct the basement, the flooring, everywhere you plastered it, you put concrete, you, you've uh, painted it. What is the weakest portion? It is the door, hence, you see people putting all kinds of surveillance cameras, putting all kinds of surveillance uh, machinery in place. So you see all of these things at the door, because the door is the weak link, if you like. And the door is resting on hinges that opens into the house, correct? So Allah is saying on that day, the in other surahs, as we'll find out inshallah ta'ala in the 30th juz, that the skies will be torn apart, will be torn to pieces. The skies, the, the stars are gonna fall. So Allah said, you will see the sky turn into gateways, into doors. This thing that you thought that it is so remarkable, no cracks in it, on that day it will have cracks and it will be broken and torn apart, and you'll see it turn to doorways and you'll see cracks all over the place. Ayah number 20, Allah says, وَسُيِّرَتِ الْجِبَالُ فَكَانَتْ سَرَابًا Allah says, and the mountains are removed, and they will be like a mirage. What's so fascinating about this ayah is, earlier in the surah, what did we learn? That the mountains are what? They are awtad, awtada, Allah calls the mountains. So you and I, and we explained this last week, that we, whenever you go out camping, whether whenever you go out to uh, put a tent in the outdoors, what happens? You nail it with a peg. Well, the pegs of this earth are the mountains themselves. These mountains, Allah is saying that was jibal, that they will become as if they are easily moved, because suyira, suyira means to become easily moved, to become mobile. So what we are learning is these pegs, these massive creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are gonna move, subhanAllah. And the last thing that you imagine moving 
are the mountains. Nobody talks about the mountains moving. Yeah, clouds move all the time. But who talks about mountains moving? Allah is saying the mountains will be moving. And because that sight is going to be so unbelievable, that sight is going to be so incredible, that human beings will think it's a mirage. They'll look at these mountains far off and they're moving like that. I mean, you can imagine, just, just think about it. You're looking at these mountains far off in the distance and they're moving. You will honestly think that, you know, man, this has to be a mirage. I, I, I think I'm either hallucinating or I don't, you can't ever comprehend such massive structures moving in the first place. SubhanAllah. So, وَسُيِّرَةِ الْجِبَالُ فَكَانَتْ sarada. Allah says, Allah says, truly hellfire is a place of ambush. Allah calls the fire of hell a place of ambush, mirsad. Now what does mirsad mean? Mirsad comes from rasada. And rasada from mursad is one who is trying to ambush. So Allah describes as describes the fire of hell as a place waiting in ambush. A place that is ideal for an ambush. This is what the hellfire is being described as. And Allah is teaching you and me that Jahannam is, dis is designed. The entire architecture of Jahannam is designed with the only intent to hide and attack the enemy. And SubhanAllah, this is why the believers on the day of resurrection, as the Prophet ﷺ told us, it will be the bridge of Sirat. The bridge that is thinner than a strand of hair, it is sharper than the edge of a sword, and is craftier than a fox. These are the wordings of our beloved Rasul ﷺ. So what kind of bridge is this? Again, these are matters of the ghaib. You and I can just kind of conjure up an image, but we can never truly appreciate or understand what kind of a bridge is this? Craftier than a fox? What does this mean? This is where the idea comes in that the believers based on their iman will immediately, inshallah ta'ala, cross over this bridge, which by the way is on above the fire of hell. And it leads where? Straight into Jannah for those who will be saved. But those who will be from those people that cross the boundaries that disobey the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they'll immediately plop under. They'll fall into the blazing fire. And that is the ambush. That is the ambush. Jahannam will sneak up to them and pluck them out of the sirat and take them in. SubhanAllah, it's a horrifying condition if you even try to picture it. Allah then explains further, ayah number 22. Allah says, for the rebellious, a place of destination. Allah says, this Jahannam is a mirsad, is a place of ambush for the taghin. For those who have committed taghiyan. What is taghiyan? Taghiyan, as far as explained, is if you consider a container filled with water, you fill it up, fill it up, fill it up, up until it reaches the brim and then Tuyan happens. It crosses, it overflows. So the human beings who were overflowing with rebellion against God, who, who were overflowing with disobedience against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah commanded them not to do this action. But they felt, no, I don't think this means this. I think I know better. And they crossed the limits of Allah. These are those who are taghin. Littaghina ma'ab. What is ma'ab? Ma'ab means a place that they will have to keep going back to over and over and over. What does this mean? And this is from the amazing depths of the Arabic language. Allah says, Littaghina ma'ab. A place where they will be returning to. So this gives us a sense. This gives us an idea that the people of Jahannam will constantly be trying to escape Jahannam. They will constantly be trying to get out of Jahannam. But every time they try to get out, what happens? It sucks them back in. It takes them back in. So hence it is ma'am. It keeps on pushing and pulling them back into it. So this is what ma'aba is. 
Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 23, In which they will remain forever and ever, or for ages and ages. Okay? Now I want you guys to pay attention now. Something interesting is going to take place. It's good we don't have a big crowd, so it will become easier somewhat to, inshallah ta'ala, for you guys to digest this. لابثين فيها أحقابا in which they will remain for ages the word used for ages we find in the Quran there's the word خالدين خالد خالدين فيها أبدا live there and forever and ever now we see here Allah doesn't say خالدين فيها أبدا Allah says أحقابا what is this term أحقابا you see أحقاب is the plural of حقب what is حقب Ali ibn Abi Talib, Allah ta'ala, the great companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his son-in-law, was married to which daughter? What's the daughter's name? Fatima, Allah. Ali was married to Fatima, Allah ta'ala, anha. The son-in-law of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the, uh, the third, khal rather the fourth khalifa of Islam, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Allah ta'ala, anhum, he explained, what is this haqab? He said, one haqab, so the ayah says, ahqaba. Ahqaba is the plural, singular is haqab. Ali says that a haqab is 80 years long, but it doesn't stop there. He says a haqab is 80 years long with every, in these 80 years, every day of which is 1,000 years long. So one haqab becomes what? One haqab becomes 1,000 multiplied by 365, so that's 365,000 multiplied by 80. So you have 3.65 million multiplied by 8. That is one haqab. Okay, that is one haqab. Allah says, fiha ahqaban. There will be therefore multiple haqabs. So what does this mean then? This means that it is a number that you can't even quantify. Now, with our number crunching, we may be able to establish a number, but that tells you these are the number of years people who will live in the fire of hell. Well, this led some people, and this is where it gets a little bit of an advanced discussion. This is what led some scholars to say that Jahannam comes to an end. That Allah says, Ahqaban, Allah is saying that they will not be there in forever, but they will be there for a time, albeit millions upon millions of years. And you and I know a milli micro second in Jahannam is unfathomable. So these guys will be there for millions upon millions of years. So some of the scholars, they said, well, Jahannam perhaps will one day be put an end to. And they say this ayah is a proof for that. And some of the heavyweight scholars of our deen, they actually uh, had held this opinion and they even wrote some treatises and they call this concept, or this concept is called fana unna, that the, the annihilation of the fire of hell itself, that one day it will come to an end. And these theologians, these scholars, they reasoned and they said, well, Allah has said in Hadith Qudsi that my Rahmah has overwhelmed my anger, my wrath. My mercy has overwhelmed my wrath. So they said it does not make sense for Jahannam to exist eternally. So they suggested that in light of ayat such as 23 of Surah Naba, they said that it then stands to reason, this is a theory, again, this, these are theories that the scholars would discuss. So don't think that theories are only when you do your PhD and you're studying, doing research work, and then we put forth a theory. No, in fact, scholars of Islam thought a lot, and they would spend, you know, days, hours, years, thinking and reflecting deeply over a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, over the ayat of the Quran. So they said that, Therefore, they believe that the fire of hell will one day, I don't want to say extinguished, no, I'm not going to say extinguished, but that the fire of hell will come to an end. Now, a word of caution here though. 
fire of hell will come to an end, does it mean the inhabitants of fire will then enter Jannah? And the answer is no. The inhabitants of fire, after they have spent billions upon billions of torture and severe punishment and unspeakable, you know, torture and torment, that they, along with Jahannam, would be destroyed. This is the theory, again, that they mention. So this was a little bit of the advanced issue that I wanted to put forth before you. So if you hear that some people say, oh, you know, there's this concept among Muslim Sunni scholars that the Day of Judgment will come to an end, and the answer is yes, there is this theory, there is this discussion. But again, it is theory. We don't know 100%, correct? So for our purposes, in light of other ayat of the Quran that say, خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا abada, by the way, these scholars, they're not, they're, they're not average people. They, they have their their evidences, and they say even Khalidina Abada is also quantifiable, okay? But in <coughs> any case, our belief is, just as Jannah will last forever, Jahannam will also last forever. For purposes of our discussion, nobody wants to say, oh, okay, well, they'll spend five billion years in Jahannam, and eventually, you know, they'll make it to Jannah. We don't even want, want that to happen. We don't want to see Jahannam at all. All we want is straight to Jannah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those that we don't even get to see the wrath of Jahannam. And this is what you and I must aim for. And it's not difficult. We mentioned in our Aqidah class that what are the things, the bare minimum level of Iman? Stick to the five pillars. You do the five pillars with sincerity. You commit sins, but every time you commit a sin, you don't justify your sin. You turn back to Allah with tawbah. You turn back to Allah with repentance then inshallah ta'ala, you will not be thrown into Jahannam. You will be admitted into Allah's garden, Allah's paradise, Allah's kingdom, the kingdom of God. Inshallah, we pray to Allah that he grants us Jannah. So the point being, whether it's quantifiable, so I'm reiterating, whether it's quantifiable, okay, ahqaba means, you know, limited number of time, whether it's billions of years, or one day Jah Jahannam will come to an end and all that. All of this discussion is actually not even necessary for our purposes. For our purposes, we believe that we just don't want to even enter Jahannam. We don't even want to see Jahannam. Our issue is that inshallah ta'ala, we want to enter straight into Allah's Rahmah. Ayah number 24. Allah says, La yadhuquna fiha wala sharaba. Allah says, they will not taste therein any coolness or drink. You see, for the desert dwellers, where there are sandstorms, where the temperature reaches scorching heat of 45, 50, 55 degrees, Allah where the wind that is blowing is actually, you feel like it's roasting your eyelashes, your, your face, it's that intensely hot. So what are the things that actually bring about relief from this? It, it is cool breeze and cool drinks. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, when these people enter the blazing, scorching heat of Jahannam, they will not taste therein any coolness, any bard, wala shara. Nor will they taste any drink, any coolness of drink. Now, some of you who are a little bit of uh, intermediate students of tafsir, you would say, no, but brother, we've heard that Jahannam has in it parts that are, and this is true, we learn from authentic hadith, Parts that are extremely hot and parts that are extremely cold. Jahannam has these portions. So how do we understand this? <coughs> Allah is saying they will not feel any bard therein. Well, this bard Allah is describing in ayah 24 of Surah Naba. Allah is saying some a coldness that soothes you. That brings about some sort of relief. That's the coldness that's talked about. So in the hadith I talk about Jahannam's intense cold, that coolness is a type of coolness that destroys, that inflicts pain, all right? You should know this. In an authentic hadith, the Prophet wasallam said that Jahannam takes breath and releases its breath. He said, when you feel the intense scorching heat, this is from the breath that Jahannam has taken. So about 55, 60 degrees perhaps in the burning, scorching desert heat. That is from Jahannam. Again, these are matters of the light. The Prophet said it, we believe. How is it connected? Are there um, invisible tunnels that are connecting to the dunya from Jahannam? How is it? We don't talk about that. 
okay? And similarly, when, you know, in the intense winter, they say the polar vortex, you are having feels like minus 35, minus 38, minus 40 degrees Celsius, you know, that cold, it doesn't relieve, that cold kills, that cold destroys. Imam Ibn al-Qayyib rahimahullah, he said, it's amazing how two opposite characteristics produce the same effect. He said, if you were to take burning hot coals, what is it going to do? Hot coals, it's going to burn your hand. And he said, similarly, you take a huge piece of ice on your hand. What sensation do you feel? Burning. That's why it's called frost what? Frost bite. The subhanAllah, the entire, it's almost as though it is burnt up. The, the body cannot heal from it anymore. They got to amputate that part of the body. SubhanAllah. Jahannam has that. May Allah protect us from it. So, ayah 24, la yadhuquna, they will not get to taste therein barad or barad wala sharaba. Any relief, any coolness, nor will they taste therein any drink to satiate their thirst. Then Allah explains further, may Allah protect us from this, ayah 25, illa hamiman wa ghassaqan. Allah says, except for scalding, boiling water. You see, there's water, and those of us who study a little bit of uh, uh, physics up until college level, you study latent heat of water. So there is heat, and there's latent heat. What is this latent heat? This is the heat that is called, quote unquote, hidden heat in physics we study. So the steam, we all know this, even the most common person who's not gone to school understands that steam burns more seriously than the actual burning, boiling water, correct? Because of that intense, so Allah says Hameem. Hameem is boiling, scalding water. This is water that's even beyond 100 degrees Celsius boiling point. This is water that is scalding, that comes close to the face and the face starts melting away, the face starts getting bruised. This is how horrible the punishment is is وَغَسَّاقَ What is غَسَّاق? And dirty wound discharges. So the people in Jahannam are already undergoing such torment that they are bleeding profusely and they're, 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 it's not just blood that's coming out, blood and discharge and pus and vomit, all these evil things that you can think of, all of these are coming out and because the people of Jahannam are so thirsty, they have nothing, they will be consuming that filth. May Allah protect us from it. I mean, Ya Allah. Allah says, infected blood or pus that the companions of hell, it's exuding from them, it's coming out from them, and this is what the people of Jahannam will get to drink. Illa hamiman wasaqan. Now we move to ayah number 26. Someone may say after reading these punishments of the people of Jahannam that, oh my God, this is some serious punishment. Did these people really deserve this? So before that thought even comes to your mind, Allah answers that thought. Ayah 26, Allah says, Allah says, an exact recompense according to their crimes. An exact compensation. So don't you think that this torment and punishment and torture that they're being subjected to, this is, this is too much. This is way beyond what they did. This is ridiculous. Why is Allah doing this? And all these questions, Allah says, no, 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 no. If you were to quantify the evil that they've done, Allah says, I'm not giving them 10 times the punishment. You see, in this dunya, what happens is, again, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. When we're, something wrong has been done to us, if we have the capability of exacting revenge, what happens? We sometimes go on a power trip. We think that we have overpowered this person, so we're gonna afflict 10 times more pain on this person, correct? This is what sometimes happens. Hey, how dare he do this? Oh, really, he, he broke my cell phone? Don't worry, I'm gonna break his cell phone and his TV and his camera and his car. You know? It just goes out of control. So Allah is saying, don't think I'm being unjust, no. For Allah is the greatest example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that don't think this is way more intense than what they deserve. Uh -uh. I haven't multiplied anything. They are getting not an ounce more, not a gram more of punishment are they receiving. No, no. They're receiving exactly what they deserve. 
Another point that the scholars mention people is jaza'an wifaqan. That someone may say that, you know what, I am really still not convinced that these people, they lived for a limited amount of time in this world, correct? How come that they lived for 30, 50, 100 years in this world, and then in the hereafter, they're not given 30, 50 years of punishment, they're given an eternity of punishment. How is this fair? And our response is, quite frankly, how is it fair that you obey Allah, and you live 30, 50, 100 years in this world, and you get an eternity of paradise? Why should you get an eternity? You should get 30, 50, 20 years of whatever amount you lived in this world, you should get according to that, right? But no, Allah gives you eternity there. And Allah is, a, is the just. Why will Allah give eternity there and not give eternity in punishment? Of course He will do that. Our second response, this was the first response, the second response is, had these people been given the chance to live for an eternity, they would continue in their rebellion against Allah. That is the point. They would continue so many times. You see this in the Quran, and you will see it even in this world. Sometimes when you discuss with these people, Allah says in the Quran that these people they are asking you, O Prophet sallallahu for a miracle from Allah. If we sent down from the skies food spread for them, and we caused the mountains of Uhud to turn to gold, you know what they're going to say then? They will say that. This man is a magician, he has cast some spell on our eyesight, he has he's dazzled us. He's doing some, you know, chumantar and abracadabra with our, with, our, with our eyes. This is what they would say. And subhanAllah, in our times, you can search on YouTube, you have atheists who say that we don't believe because we don't see God, we can see Him, we can sense Him, we can smell Him, we can taste, we can hear, we can, you know. So, there's no God. So when... A, 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 a person who was debating them said, okay, frankly, I want you to answer frankly. If God was to come down right now or to speak to you right now, would you believe? He said, you're asking me frankly and truthfully, I'll be honest with you. Even if God came down, I won't believe. Even if God came down and spoke to me directly, I would say, this is some kind of magic that this guy has done. This is, SubhanAllah. You will see this person saying something in 2018, exactly what the pagan, arrogant Arabs told the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that's documented in the Quran. So this is our second response. Whether they live a couple you know, decades in this dunya, and then you're saying they'll get an eternity of punishment. Well, if they lived an eternity, they would still continue in their evil ways. So that is our response. Moving on to Ayah 27. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا لَا يَرْجُونَ حِسَابًا Allah now declares, Allah tells us as a statement of fact, surely they did not hope for reckoning. So you're thinking that, oh my God, their punishment is way beyond, that needs to be given, they're being given way too much, blah, blah, blah. Well, Allah says, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا لَا يَرْجُونَ حِسَابًا They were those who never hoped for a day of reckoning, that there will be a day I'll be held to account. They're not looking forward to it. You see, the, the wording in this ayah is very careful. Allah did not say that they didn't expect accountability. No, it's not that they didn't expect. Because see, if the wording would have been they didn't expect accountability, that means something unexpected happened. Correct? So, for example, you did not check your weather app that it's going to be an ice storm outside today. So, in, for whatever reason, mashallah, you're busy in your household, you know, chores, doing, taking care of your laundry and cleaning up the house, didn't look out the windows, whatever, which is pretty unlikely. You stayed away from your cell phone. And then suddenly you step out and, oh my God, unexpected. Oh, there's an ice storm. I didn't expect that. But for someone who has been listening to the news, for the last two, three days, they know that on April 14th, there is warning, Environment Canada has issued warnings about icy conditions, about rain. Okay, you know, you are expecting it. So Allah is saying in this ayah, they're not, it's not that something unexpected happened, that they came on the day of Qiyamah and they're shocked. Oh my God, what just happened? No. They knew and they did not accept the message. So they never even hoped for Allah's mercy. Therefore, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate them in the manner that they deserve. You see, in our times, it's very commonplace. When someone passes away, people quickly run to say, R.I.P. R.I.P. Someone who never made such that to Allah, never believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, someone who never believed in the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa someone who lived an evil life. Now that this person is dead because he or she is a celebrity, because he or she is a scientist well known, Muslims subhanAllah are writing R.I.P. R.I.P. Rest in peace, rest in peace. Why can't we make dua? I mean, maybe, maybe this, the answer is exactly this ayah. When they were living in this dunya, they were never expecting for Allah's hisab. They were never expecting for Allah's rahmah. If they were not expecting for Allah's rahmah, why should they receive Allah's rahmah? So, does it mean that, that we want evil for those who don't believe in Islam, that they will go to fire hell? A'udhu billah, no, not at all. We pray and sincerely hope that they accept Islam, but once they have passed away, the the most that we can say is Allah is the just, Allah will deal with them the way that they deserve. So I'm no one to say he's going to Jannah, he's going to Jahannam, that person is going to Jahannam. No. All I can say is as long as this person never accepted Islam, this person is not going to enter Jannah. Now beyond this, what more? Are they Jahannami? Are they Jannati? Maybe did they secretly take the Shahada and then they died and all of that? I don't need to get into that discussion. For me is my religion and for me is my way. I know that this path leads to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I need to tread that path with sincerity. So whoever has died, it's none of my business to assign Jannah or Jahannam to them. But neither should I go out of my way to make dua for a person who died upon disbelief and kufr and I should make dua that they rest in peace or they go to Jannah. Well, it's none of my business. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be that bothered. So this is the point. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا لَا يَرْجُونَ حِسَابًا Ayah 28, And Allah says, they called our revelations false, and they were strongly in denial of it. You see, kithab is to deny, but kathabu means over and over deny. It is an action that is done continually. It's one thing for a person to be a kathib. Kathib means a, someone who lied. Okay? Kathib is someone who lied. He lied, okay? But Kadhab is the one who habitually lies, who cannot take the truth and accept it. This person's aim in life is to keep on lying and going out of their way to deny. So this is what Allah is saying, وَكَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا كِذَّابًا They denied it with a vehement form of denial. وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ كِتَابًا And Allah says, And everything we have recorded in a book. So don't be shocked. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us that every single thing that you did, that you said, that you acted upon, that you will find it in front of you on the day of resurrection. Ayah 30, we're almost getting to the end of the surah. Allah says, so taste the penalty and never will we increase you except in torture, except in torment. Allah says, then go ahead and taste all of you. Allah is speaking to them. This is showing his extreme anger with them. Allah says, so go ahead and taste the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَلَنْ نَزِيدَكُمْ إِلَّا عَذَابًا And you'll get nothing but more and more and more punishment again in accordance with the evil that you did. Now we move on. Ayah number 31. Here is the good news. Remember, this is the methodology of the Quran. Never does Allah talk about punishment except that He will talk about His mercy, his love, his care, his compassion, his gentleness. Whenever Allah talks about something that causes you to be afraid of his wrath, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala follows it up and talks about his mercy. That's why in our dealings, whether it's with our kids, whether it's with our spouses, and with our family members, it should always be a balance. And as one of our teachers would say, that whenever Allah mentions the fire, he would then mention the fire exit. He'll mention how to get out of that punishment.
Allah says in ayah 31, إِنَّ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ مَفَازَ Surely, no doubt about it, the muttaqun, those who are righteous, those who lived taqwa, this concept of taqwa, to be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who actually lived it in their lives and became the muttaqun, for them is mafazan. You see, mafaz is translated as success. It's translated as paradise. However, mafaz is a word that has so much going on within it. One of the meanings of mafaz is success. The other meaning is the place of success. And then the appointed time of success. All of these meanings are contained within the word mafaz. So it is jannah, the appointed time. Think about the people on Yom Al-Qiyamah. They'll be looking forward to it. It's kind of like how you're about to get a prize, a bonus, a check. Every time your manager is bringing your paycheck to you, you're looking forward to it. You're looking forward to that brand new car that you get to sit down in. You're looking forward to the prize that you're about to get, the present that you're going to get. You're looking forward to it. So the muttaqun will be looking forward to entering mafaz, entering uh, jannah. Allah describes this jannah further. Allah says gardens and grapeyards. Allah is saying gardens and vineyards of grapes. Allah is calling this garden hadiqa. Now, hadiqa is not just any garden, because a garden in the Arabic language also can be, uh, the, the term for it can also be jannah. Jannah means garden. But hadiqa is a garden that's surrounded by tall fence. A tall fence. What does this signify? It signifies privacy. It signifies that's your territory. That belongs to you. It's got these gardens, luscious gardens, with grapes. Grapes is a or grapes are fruits that act as both food and drink. It acts as a food and also as a drink. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that no one will have access to this special house of yours, this special chateau, this mansion that you own. Nobody has access to it. These are gardens that are privately fenced around. From the meaning of hadiqa, people is also the pupil of the eye. The pupil of the eye. Now when you look at the pupil, what happens? What do you notice? If you shine light, of course, it goes small, it, it dilates and it grows again. But it's surrounded by, what is it called? The iris. So what are we learning then? The pupil, Allah is calling this garden, again, these are linguistic from one of the meanings of hadiqa, it's also pupil. What we're learning is this garden is fenced and it is surrounded by the most beautiful colors. It's surrounded by the most beautiful of flowers, of plantations, of, of, of what gardens contain. SubhanAllah. So this is what hadiqa means. And not hadiqa, hadaiqa wa anaba. Allah is saying in the plural, gardens and vineyards. Ayah 33, وَكَوَاعِبَ أَتْرَابًا Allah says, and you will have your companions that will be of equal age. Companions. So, usually, our sisters, they say, why does this, the Qur'an, talk about women of Jannah for men? What about for us women? What is there? And you should always realize this is the style of the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, أَلَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقْ won't Allah know his creation? Of course. So it is not in the adab of the Qur'an to talk about the, uh, uh, the, the male genders. No. The adab of the Qur'an is for men, they will mention their companions, and naturally, in it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us, for women, they'll have their companions. Naturally. Why? Because Allah is the just. Is it possible that Allah will give one gender something and not give the other gender anything? No, not at all. So this is one of the styles of the Qur'an, one of the adab in which the Qur'an mentions itself. So the Qur'an says, وَكَوَاعِبَ أَتْرَابَ The most beautiful of women as, of, as companions for uh, the men in Jannah and naturally for the women who do righteous and pious deeds for them, they will have the most beautiful, the most handsome men that Allah has created just for them in Jannah. وَكَأْسَنْ Look at the Qur'an, subhanAllah. 
Allah says, وَكَأْسَنْ دِهَاقَ The loose translation of which is, and a cup full to the brim. A cup that is full to the brim. But now, Ka'as doesn't necessarily do justice to cup. I mean, what is cup? Okay, cup, a glass. You see, the Qur'an is not in modern standard Arabic. The Qur'an is not in Fusha either. The Qur'an is in ancient classical Arabic. This is what the Qur'an is. So Ka'as was a special vessel, okay? For lack of a better term, special glass that was used when only the most expensive drinks would be placed in it. Only when the most exotic wines would be poured into it. This is what Ka'as was. So Allah says this Ka'as will be there and Diha'an. And it is overflowing. It is full to the brim. So it's not like you pour in, you know, a little bit and then you take some sip and then pour a little bit. You take some. No, no, no. It is already filled to the brim. And what else? The, the whole purpose of mentioning Diha'an is that it'll be splashing. So as you're picking this ka'as, may Allah make every one of us from the Ameen, you're picking up this ka'as, the drink is actually splashing over this ka'as and falling to the floor. But hey, it's Jannah. You don't need to mop anything. It's not that it's going to cause any stains or bring about any, you know, dirt or... No, subhanAllah, none of that. This is what ka'as is. Wa ka'asan diha'a. And then ayah 35. لا يسمعون فيها لغوا ولا كذابا. No ill speech will the people of Jannah hear therein, nor will they hear any kind of falsehood. لا يسمعون فيها لغوا ولا كذابا. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is saying that any kind of idle speech. We mentioned the meaning of لغو in our khutbah yesterday, and that is that. There is this lahu, there is this evil speech that is being spoken that people, the Muslimin, have been subjected to false propaganda, have been subjected to evil statements about their, their, their Lord, their God, about their religion, about their Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They've been subjected to all of these things. Allah says in Jannah, none of that will happen anymore. No lahu, no evil talk, nor any nor any lies. In the media, you hear people talk all these evil things about Muslims. SubhanAllah, all of this will become of the past. None of it. Another point of benefit, and this is something interesting. Allah talked about your private mansion, your chateau, your, your, your palace, your garden. And then in it, you're having your wives, your companions from paradise. And then you're having wine to drink. When you construct this image here in this dunya, usually what is it accompanied with? SubhanAllah, one of my teachers mentioned this. He said, what is it accompanied with? It's accompanied with fahisha, correct? It's accompanied with evil speech, with lies, with disgust. You see all of these quote-unquote rich people, they have their private villas that is secluded from others, and then they have their parties, and then they have women, and they have wine, what is happening there in those gatherings? Nothing but evil, filth, bad language, right? In Jannah, you can imagine now the same thing for the believers, but Allah is saying there's not going to be evil there. They won't be speaking, you know, expletives and bad <coughs> languages. They're not going to use foul language. No, it's not going to happen because this is Jannah. In dunya, no matter how much you want to try it, it doesn't work. It always leads to haram. It leads to licentiousness. It leads to fahisha. It leads to evil. In Jannah, the opposite is the case. Ayah 36, Jaza'an min rabbika ata'an hisaba. A reward from your master, an ample calculated gift, according to the best of their good deeds. SubhanAllah. Think about this and contrast this to what Allah says about the people of Jahannam. What did Allah say about the people of Jahannam? When they are subjected to the punishment in Jahannam, jaza'an wifaqan. Exactly measure for measure with their evil deeds is their punishment. All right? When it comes to the pleasures and the delights of Jannah, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Jaza'an min rabbik. That this is a special reward from your Lord 
عطاءً حسابا and beyond your hisab. So when it came to your good deeds, Allah didn't say, we're going to give you a garden with exact measure of how much good deeds you did. You prayed five times a day, you gave the zakah, you went to hajj, you were able to fast the month of Ramadan. So exactly with that, I will give you commensurate with that. I will give you your reward. Mm -mm, no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we will give you more. An ample gift from Allah. Mir Rabbik. Allah says from your master. So Allah is the one who gives. Allah is the one who creates. Allah is the one who provides. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. That this is a gift to the one who deserves. And gift, by the way, is also given to those who don't deserve. Sometimes out of your love, don't you give gifts to someone who you see? You know what? No, subhanAllah, this person also. And let me give it to him. This is what Allah says, عَطَاءً حِسَابًا جَزَاءً مِنْ رَبِّكَ عَطَاءً حِسَابًا That this عَطَاء, this is a gift from Allah out of His own love and mercy and generosity. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. Qatala رضي الله تعالى عنه, one of the tabi'un, one of the scholars of tafsir, he mentioned and he explained the term حِسَاب in this ayah. He says, here, what it denotes is that Allah will give a person so much that this person will start saying, I can't accept anymore. Stop, it's enough. It's kind of like you go to that Dawat and you know, mashallah, Masood Bahi is giving you biryani. And you're like, brother, I'm done. He adds two, three more spoons. And then he says, you have to take dessert. And you have to take halwa. And you're like, oh my God, I'm going to die. Please stop. So that is the idea, is the concept. That you keep on giving and giving and giving that the person says, SubhanAllah, I can't even take it anymore. But Allah will make you worthy of it. May Allah make us worthy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause us to enter Jannah. Ameen. The last few ayat, Allah says, رَبِّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَ الرَّحْمَانِ لَا يَمْلِكُونَ مِنْهُ خِطَابًا Allah says, all of this is from the master of the heavens and the earth and whatever is between them, the most merciful. They possess not from him authority for speech. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given them any authority. Meaning on that day, nobody will have the authority to say anything. The entire judgment will be in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And something also amazing is, look at the way Allah ended this ayah. Allah says, وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَ الرَّحْمَانِ لَا يَمْلِكُونَ مِنْهُ الْخِطَابَ Allah says, He is the Lord of the heavens and the earth and what is between, what is in between them, the most merciful. So Allah is saying, O oh, you who is still disbelieving, still rebelling, still disobeying, you're still going against what Allah is saying to you, remember He's a Rahman. Allah could have said, ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِقْرَامِ Or Allah could have said, you know, He is Al-Qawi, Al-Aziz. So all names from Allah, He's the most powerful, He is the mighty, but Allah chose to, to uh, place the name of Rahman over here as a reminder to people that He is always close and ready to accept your mercy. Allah says the day that a ruh and the angels will stand forth in rows upon rows. None shall speak except him whom the most merciful Rahman allows to speak. And this person will call us sawaba. This person will speak nothing but the truth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying on that day, a ruh, and according to ijma, consensus amongst all of the scholars of tafsir, they are saying that a ruh is the angel Jibreel. The angel Jibreel will be the one who will descend that day. Another benefit of knowing this is that a ruh will be standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning angel Jibreel will be standing. And even angel Jibreel will not speak. Everybody knows the closest angel to Allah is the head of the angels, who? Jibreel. So if Jibreel doesn't have the audacity to speak on that day, who else can? Nobody else can. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us. And also Allah is teaching the pagans. Because remember, what did the mushrikun of Makkah believe that the angels are? What did they believe? Do you remember? Yeah. Daughter. That they're the daughters of Allah. 
they felt that, hey, you know what, Muhammad, you're, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you're sending us this message, you're preaching to us, you're telling us this, that, and the other. You know what, we're not interested in this message of yours. We've got these, you know, these angels, the daughters of God, who will intercede for us. So, يَوْمَ يَقُومُ الْرُوحُ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ صَفَّى Safa, when you stand in Sufuf, Saf means to stand so tightly together. And that is how, by the way, we should stand in our Salah. To be like a wall. This is how Saf is done. And when Saf is done, when someone of authority comes, when someone of authority comes, you all know when the generals and the high-ranking lieutenants in, in, in the army appear, what happens? Soldiers, are they like, you know, standing to the side and kind of slouching? No! They're standing straight. Then this is how we must be in our salah. We're in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how we should consider ourselves. So Allah is saying that all of these angels shall be standing like that, like a wall. Nobody will be able to say anything. And the one who will be speaking is the one given permission by Allah. And this person will speak nothing but the truth. ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمُ الْحَقِّ That is the day, without doubt, the truth. فَمَنْ شَاءَ اتَّخَذَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِ مَآبًا So whosoever wills, let him seek a place with his master. Ma'aba, his place. Remember what did we say Ma'aba when Allah talked about Jahannam? A place of constant return for those who try to escape, they will be constantly returned to it. Allah is saying to Allah, when you return this also Ma'ab. Because you are human beings. You sin, you make tawbah, you come back to it. And then you sin, you make tawbah, you come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep coming back to Allah. He is the right, He is where the ma'ab belongs. That's where we have to go. ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمُ الْحَقْ Many meanings of yawmul haqq. That is the true day. That is the day. In fact, that is the day of truth. No other day is the day of truth. That is the day of truth. That is the day when truth shall be made clear from falsehood. Finally, ayah number 40, and we end the surah with this. إِنَّا أَنذَرْنَاكُمْ عَذَابًا قَرِيبًا يَوْمَ يَنْظُرُ الْمَرْءُ مَا قَدَّمَتْ يَدَاهُ يَقُولُ الْكَافِرُ يَا لَيْتَنِي كُنْتُ تُعَابًا Allah says, Undoubtedly, we have warned you of a near punishment, the day when man will see what deeds he has sent forth. Every single day, brothers and sisters, you and I, we do deeds and we submit it to Allah. We're doing it, we submit. We're doing it, we submit. That day we'll come face to face with our actions and that day the disbeliever will say, destruction, ya laytani kuntu turaba. I wish I was destroyed. I wish I was destroyed. I wish I was turned to dust. You know what's interesting? The word ya laytani cannot even be translated. Ya laytani. You see in the English language, the closest that you can come to is such despair such despair that words cannot even describe it. But Arabic has a word for it. Ya laytani. I wish how, how huge of a catastrophe has befallen me. What a great calamity has befallen me. Ya laytani. Kuntu turaba. I wish I was nothing but dust this day. That I don't have to see the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon all of us. We ask Allah that he grants us tawfiq to act upon whatever is heard. We ask Allah that he brings us close to his book, that we learn from his Quran, that we act upon its teachings and its guidance, and that we are from those who will be resurrected in the company of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and all of the rusul and the anbiya alayhi wa sallam, and that he grants us his jannat and his hadaiq. Jazakallah khairan wa